something uh, uncomfortable about uh, light detection and uh, maybe uh, elimination of perception, if it can be detected easily. So I think maybe there is a, a strong undertow of resistance to uh, exploring this topic. I know it sounds a little off the wall, and it's not very practical, but uh, uh, that's Project that uh, I teach evidence, and I every year, every year when I teach it, I tell my students about this uh, technology, these lie detection studies, and then I ask them if we had a perfect lie detector, we could put you know a cap on the witness's head, not the defendant, the witness's head, um, and, and and it would light up green if they're telling the truth and red if they're lying, and it's perfect, so you know it's a hypo. I'm allowed to I'm allowed to, to say that. Um, who would who who thinks we should use it? And um, in every, and it's pretty consistent that about half of the students every time think that we should not use even a perfect lie detector, and even when someone's life or um, you know uh, property is at stake. And I think that that gets very much to what what Anna's saying. 
Yeah, and, and I think uh, I think it's a great question. Um, I think it's probably going to be in the interplay of, of all of the uh, all of those three things. Um, and I suspect that uh, the reason half the students uh, suggest they wouldn't want to have an absolute truth is because uh, some of uh, what people say is all about perception as well. Um, and that goes to part of what uh, one of the speakers talked about. Um, one can easily say what is the truth to them, but it's uh, subjective to some degree. And having grown up in a Mediterranean family, I've, I've seen uh, truths described uh, around the table and all of them are completely different. <laughs> so I think the biggest barrier will first barrier will be science. What's the science? Um, I, think, I think it's adequate. Some legal systems will accept it, some legal systems won't. I think that judge in New York's response will be very similar to that of half of her students. By the way, all of your students felt the same thing, half of them were lying. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there will be resistance to the legal system. Um, but I also, I, I agree with uh, Daniel about the cultural discomfort with this, and I think a really interesting side of that is the international comparisons. The U.S. uses the polygraph much, much more than any place in Europe, certainly. Europeans tend to be very strongly anti-polygraph. When I talk to European neuroscientists about this, and European lawyers, they kind of view the polygraph as an American disease, an American pathology. We always want this nice mechanical fix, and there must be something else with it. So on the other hand, in India, the criminal justice system in India uses polygraphy. It uses uh, what they call narcoanalysis, which is truth serums. It uses a particularly bizarre version of an EEG lie detection test, what they call BIOS. And it uses a lot of beating the crap out of the defendant as a way to try to get to truth. Um, so I do think there's interesting cultural differences about lie detection. I think I think one of the there, there are a couple of things I think um, are underlying the discomfort. One is the recognition that human beings don't think in simple truths and falsehoods, but that human experience is multivariate and multivariate and complex, and that people's ideas about things are not always set in you know, kind of binaries that these kinds of analyses. Yes, certainly there are times and places where a binary yes or no determining what truth or lies is um, appropriate. But I think that the idea that we could come up with a really reliable, simple lie detector and that it will solve a lot of the problems that we think we have in forensics seems to me to be naive, both in terms of its um, uh, conception of what truth and lying is. And I think that's one of the reasons why it works so comfortable with the idea of philosophy. Um, I think they have a, a, a more complex idea of truth and falsehood than, than we are, um, than, our, than are suggested by our use of philosophy. So I think that that's one issue. The second issue, and, and Hank mentioned this, but I think it's very, very important. Um, you know, I, I've been very vocal about my opposition to live tech and technology, but not entirely. Um, what I am extremely concerned about is the coercive use of biotech and technology. I think if someone themselves wants to come in and see that go to Cephos and see Steve and use this technology and we can show this reliable and valid all those things, I think that's fine. I have no problem with that. But let's be realistic. I mean, if we have a technology like this, is it possible that it's not going to be used by security forces, military forces, and um, in other countries by dictatorial regimes and totalitarian regimes coercively insofar as that's possible. Of course, it's difficult to use an fMRI coercively, but this technology is going to progress. So I think if we sit here and ask simple questions like, is it okay to use it on a witness that might be lying in the courtroom, we can all feel pretty good about saying, yeah, that might be okay. But if we really think about what the implications are of this technology down the road, I think it brings up enormous ethical questions that um, we shouldn't gloss over too easily. Yeah, 
I, I fully believe it's the legal system. You know, working on these DNA cases, the lawyers in 2012, most of them are dealing with their first DNA case. We asked them about DNA. They had absolutely no clue. They have freaked out about it. You go and you talk to the judges about it, you present this stuff, you start talking about statistics, you start talking about mixtures and touch DNA and all these other types of things. These, these the judges are completely clueless. So this is a technology that's been around for 25 years. It's gone over the hump now because it's DNA, it just gets admitted, just you know, like all of our other forms of technology that have been around forever. But when the DNA first came into the field, it took you know, years and years and years for it. And many of the same issues that people had then, like for example, can you present a statistic that says one in 15 billion or quintillion or some number that people have not heard of before? You know, many of the states said that they can only say, well, it's greater than 99 percent chance that you know the only person on the earth is this guy or something like that. Um, so 99 percent was was the mark. Um, and finally, you know, half our judicial, half our states right now have the Fry standard. They haven't even adopted the Daubert standard. <coughs> when was Daubert eight five? Ninety three or ninety one. Ninety three. Really late. Okay, so Daubert 93, states haven't adopted, they, they still use general acceptance. You know, I mean, does that mean that we have had no new science that's been brought to those jurisdictions that's valued, that's not scientifically, that have, you know, those, those, those jurisdictions haven't decided to adopt the Daubert standard, or the constitution of those states haven't decided to adopt those? It's hard to imagine. What are the other things we standards? Good evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the general acceptance standard says that scientific evidence um, compared to other expertise is admissible if it's generally accepted within the field. Um, that in, in federal courts, the standard is um, called Daubert from a case, uh, the Daubert case, and, um, and in, in under that standard, general acceptance is one uh, one factor, um, and there are other factors, peer review and testability, et cetera. And so um, the difference is said to be that under Daubert, the question is reliability, um, and something can be reliable even if it's not yet generally accepted in the field. So um, so Daubert, uh, in practice, turns out to be more restrictive. It lets less stuff in. But, um, but there's not a huge amount of difference uh, in, in admissibility Technique that is, um, you know, new, cutting edge, of uncertain reliability under either standard is probably not going to be admissible. Other questions from the? Yeah. Sure. <coughs> so I think there's a, a use. I do think light detection is special um, for all sorts of interesting cultural and scientific reasons. I think an interesting thought experiment is to think about how how courts and people would react to a pain detector, to something that did neuroimaging and said whether this person is having a subjective perception of pain. Granted, it couldn't necessarily tell you why they were having it, whether it was psychogenic, whether it was as a result of hypnotism, whether it's a phantom pain from an amputee, et cetera. But assume for a moment you had a neuroimaging that could say with 98% sensitivity and specificity, this person is or is not feeling pain. I think we would accept that a lot faster, even though, in effect, it really is being used as a light detector because you ask the person whether he's feeling pain and then you double check on it. But it doesn't seem like, it seems more like a medical test. It seems more traditional and it doesn't seem to implicate either the ethical or the legal, special legal concerns we have around the light and have around the, the jury as the detector of the What do you do when, in that test when it shows that a person is in pain and they are not in pain? Do you believe them or do you believe the test? And, and I think that Dr. Lakin is, is absolutely correct that, um, that the courts impose a much higher standard. I called it in some of my writing, I called it Dallas Plus. Um, much, much higher standard for anything that is around um, credibility of witnesses and, and lie detection. And is imposed on any other um, scientific technique. So um, the, 
lots of many of the forensic techniques are extremely questionable and are routinely admitted, like uh, partial fingerprint, bite mark, bullet, ballistics. They're they're much less reliable than probably polygraph, and they're uh, routinely admitted. Their analysis. Yeah. Questions from the board? I think there's a mic up there. I don't know if we need to use it. One charge. Um, so this, this question picks up on what Paul just said. Uh, you guys have mostly been talking today about um, what we might call post-conviction. So you try and figure out whether someone's lying about something they did in the past. It seems to me that the issues are going to be even more important and interesting uh, legally and ethically when you talk about prediction and prevention. Um, and so one thing, one thing we might uh, get technology that allows us to do is to predict whether someone's going to do something or lying about what they're going to do. I'm actually interested to hear what y'all think about uh, an ecolo what seems like a pretty ecologically valid technique for testing this. <coughs> people playing things like prisoners to limit games where they're highly incentivized to lie with their partner about what they're going to do and you can just see uh, when they lie and you can tell the truth and look at the patterns for that but that would give you a sense of whether they're doing some, whether they're lying about what they're going to do. And that seems like it's going to be something that if we ever get in the military, it's going to want really bad um, <laughs> to, to interrogate terrorists and or suspect terrorists. Um, and then the other, the other thing is prevention, which also seems uh, likely to come about before too long, probably with TMS. If you can just find the inhibitory system that is happening when people lie, and you TMS such that that's knocked out, Presumably, people might not be able to lie, and then that would create all kinds of issues as well. Mark George already filed a patent um, application for exactly that. These are TMS ones that, um, you know, once the areas of the brain are, are identified, that um, are engaged in deception, we can instruct those with TMS, and the individual will be, this is a quote, the individual will be unable to deceive, and he has to file that. File anything if you've got the fee. Right, no, I know. <laughs> but I mean, but and the, and the PTO might grant it because they grant some really dumb patents. But I mean, your, your scenario is basically a minority report, right? So now we can put someone in a scanner and we can say, are you going to kill her? And you can say, no, I have no plans to kill her. And it turns out to be a lie. And now we can, you know, proactively be um, incarcerated. So we can just put all. Can't be, there's nothing in the law. <laughs> Not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't have the technology yet, right? So pretty soon we have prisons full of people that in the future might commit crimes, and we'll all feel safer. <laughs> <laughs> in, some, in some ways, we, we do that with sex offender testing. You know, sex offenders right now, right? They're convicted. They're held civilly until they can show that they're not going to commit a crime. We, we do that right now. And to some extent, the psychiatric patients have been ruled to be dangerous to themselves or others. We commit them civilly if they're not criminal, but they can't necessarily just walk away. How, how much scientific evidence we would need to convince a court to allow that, uh, I think, is an open question. Um, in the, the sex offense stuff has been somewhat controversial, but it has been upheld by the U.S. Supreme Court. Civil commitment for sex offenders, but only after there has been a conviction of some offense. So there's been no civil commitment I know of, but of no civil, of the sexual uh, predator statutes, I think, involve people who haven't been convicted of something. It requires a conviction and a finding of some mental, I forget the language, of a mental defect or a mental abnormality, I think, um, in order for it to be constitutional. How, I don't think we will, at least in the United States, rapidly move eagerly move beyond that, unless we get into another panic about crime, which we do regularly, at which point legislatures will pass anything that helps their constituents to think that they're hard on crime, and you're left with the courts trying to, with your last recourse being the courts to try to limit um, legislators sucking up to terrify the constituents. I'll just add that one of the uh, very powerful things about this kind of technology
one in terms of, in terms of terrorism or crime wave, and couple that with a test that really, you can visually see the difference here and here, um, it can be very powerful in a, a public uh, impact of pushing for technology that may not be ready. Uh, this question is largely for uh, Dr. Lundemann, so I think you can talk about it in the presentation. Um, but I, it seems like something all of us have to do, not just others, whoever uh, wants to jump in. Um, near the end of your presentation, you talked a little bit about psychiatric applications. Um, for this technology, you talked about like uh, entrance medicine, psychotherapy. Um, and I guess it wasn't immediately clear to me how those things could be applied, at least not in a way that's sort of coercive um, and maybe has some, some strange implications. So I was wondering if you could talk a little more about exactly how um, this technology could be applied to such a Well, I actually, uh, I didn't think of coercive views at all. Um, um, as far as psychotherapy is concerned, I remember that in the pre I was uh, so happy about cures and that, and one of the images that uh, we did. Um, essentially, we are um, asked dealing with or deception or lie detections and we're kind of asked to deal with ourselves in some respect because uh, the one deception that we really kind of don't like carrying around is being able to deceive ourselves. Uh, you know, how to uh, remove certain things from your today's agenda, how to put it aside, how to not know, how to not see. The question is whether one could actually be able to live without it. And it closely resonates to uh, <clears throat> the first user of the skin conductance uh, was uh, Carl Lund, the, the one of the you know, uh, uh, pioneers of psychoanalysis. Uh, so basically, uh, where uh, deception is very more closely related to suppression and repression, which are the test mechanisms. There were actually quite interesting studies about the brain pattern of suppression of unwanted memories, it looks very much like uh, what we're seeing uh, uh, in light detection studies. So uh, the application of psychotherapy would be uh, to look at the changes in your brain response. And I'm just sort of, I'm making it up. Uh, but for example, if you wanted to see how unconscious repression became conscious, that is, you will actually have pattern of deception appearing after the year of therapy when I'm asking, you know, let's say, they, all, they always make fun of psychologists as far as, uh, you know, they will convince you that your mother did not treat you well. So if in the beginning of therapy you're saying that your mother is just great, and it looks like the truth, and then in the end of the year it starts looking like a lie, <laughs> that may be a way, basically a way to monitor changes uh, uh, in your repression and suppression of your defense mechanisms. That would be kind of an example of dealing with that. Uh, example, uh, for psychiatry itself, psychiatry major, I would say, the psych psychotic disorders. Uh, but there, it's uh, even simpler, and there is some work done. Uh, Sean Spence, uh, who passed away, but before he did, he actually started looking at uh, delusional patients. The question is, how is it, if I'm asking you about your delusion, uh, do you know that it's off? That it would have come across as an intentional deception. You could use that to monitor progress of uh, psychotic treatment. And I think that's actually pretty promising. I would be very, you know, from my clinical experience, uh, uh, psychotic patients never really quite give up their delusions. But they become less certain about them. And you know, I don't know whether I have time for a specific story, but a person who thinks that he has a chip in his head that was stolen there by the CIA in 1950 something, uh, who you know, when he, uh, some days when you confront him with that, he would like, you know, he would be very upset. Uh, after some treatment, uh, when you asked him, I said, well, yeah, so have you heard from the chip or anything? Eh, no, not really active now. Uh, shall we have a, a CT scan to look for the chip? Nah, nah, nah. So, but do you think you have a chip? So that would be a good debt. So the question is whether you can translate this into a great response, you would have some kind of monitoring tool. Uh, so <coughs> on the other hand of that, there are so many people who lie about their psychiatric symptoms. 
and now we're walking into a, a literal minefield of uh, malingering of psychiatric disorders, which closely relates to uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Greeley, uh, Professor Greeley mentioned about pain. Hey, that's basically malingering. There is quite a bit of work done there as well. Um, uh, Tatia B from Hong Kong she, uh, is doing primarily that. So these are examples. And finally, substance abuse. Again, this is a clinical duration, and it's accepted you know, as an anecdotal war that one of the most common things that is wrong with people who are addicted is that they lie. They lie above and beyond what they need to for their own protection. They just lie. They lie to everybody, and my opinion is that they also lie to themselves in a much higher rate and severity than an average person. And if that is the problem, maybe that is what should be treated in modern. So these are the examples. I'm sorry, I'm taking so long. So it may go into issues about how do you value that piece of evidence. You know, from the DNA field, yeah, it shows the person's there, but if the DNA evidence is not a chain of custody, of course, the weight of those issues. It may not go to admissibility, but it may go to weight. You don't know where the sample was for two hours. Um, as it relates to the specific populations we talked about, I mean, we haven't studied this. So it's, you know, it's really hard to know. We, we know that from some of the structural brain imaging of people who are pathological liars, that their brain seems to be hyperdeveloped in many of the same regions that we're seeing, you know, in all these lie detection studies. So in some ways you would think that maybe it would be easier to detect a pathological liar because their brain is hyperdeveloped in that region, but you know, we simply don't know. Could you tell us what those regions are that you mentioned? Yeah, they're basically they're exactly the regions that uh, Daniel mentioned. I mean we see anterior simulated very common. So would you accept that the psychopath came to you and wanted to get self-tested? Would you get them on? What would you do? You know, it's a great, it's a great question, and I, I would say that you know one of the reasons that we go to court, right, is that our judgment. You know, I like to be scientists. You know, I draw lines women. But I mean, ultimately, our success is being in court. Our our day is in court. You know, we can't sit there and do research studies until. 75 years old before I try to go to court for the first time. We go to court, we take a shot at goal, and we try to figure out, you know, what are the things that judges are saying. There were a lot of things that were said in court, that are said in court, that, that scientists don't necessarily say, you know, we, we modified some of our procedures and protocols for that. We tightened those up, and it was, very, it was a very useful experience. It's no different than when I go to court and challenge the state on something that they're doing. They modify their procedures and protocols. The protocols and procedures for all that to be modified all the time. I mean, it's science, right? What protocol do you have in your lab that hasn't changed for 20 years? Not a lot. So one of the reasons that we go there is, is, is to, to look at that. When we, now our policy is this. If we find somebody, and this is answer your question, when we find someone who's outside the demographic that we use, we put them through the ring watch. If they classify and qualify with the ring watch, 
That is, the brain responds like we would expect the brain to respond in our typical study group. Then we don't see any issue with administering a test uh, for whatever specific event that they want to have done. But we have to do that first test to show that this person, this demographic, you know, falls on that criteria. What's the issue with that? It's an end of one, you know? I mean, if it didn't work in that person, am I willing to stand up here and say, no, it's never going to work? No, it's an end of one. So, you know, we have one shot, one shot only. The test works in this person, we'll test them. If it doesn't work in that person, we're not testing. How many, what percentage of um, folks who come to you fail that brainwash uh, test? Um, we had actually one person, this was, it actually falls into a category of your thing. Um, and actually, I think if you search for it online, the report's online, because the report was inconclusive because we never tested the person. And this person had, <coughs> their mental health history was certainly questionable. And you know, again, we went back, they were convicted of something, it was post-conviction relief. This person was recanting their testimony for something else, said that you know they, they served time, but they were saying, well, I lied, and, and now I want to change my testimony against to help somebody else that was serving time in jail. And so we tested that person, and you know, they failed to bring watch. So we had to test them. Um, so that, that's the only one. That's the only one. I mean, part of the reason we made all of this because I want to see, like, what does a 76 year old guy look like? Right? I mean, you don't have a lot of, a lot of opportunities to test them like that. And an actor, too. I mean, you tested a few actors, but, you know, here's someone that's really skilled and qualified at what they do for a living. You know, if, if there's anybody that can really convince themselves or act, I don't know if convincing an actor is the same thing, but they can convince themselves. They can help them. So, so, what the science becomes as bounded as it is, as it can be, as far as the, uh, the truthfulness of the use of MRIs to detect truth versus lying in an individual. Um, and aside from the economic uh, gains that can be had from developing these products and marketing them, um, how can one convince the populace to accept the expansion of these, these powers I think it depends on uh, whether the member of the population you're trying to convince uh, thinks it, this could be useful for him or her. So if somebody does, if you, you're trying to convince somebody of something you think is true and they don't believe you, uh, then I think you're likely to welcome this kind of technology. If on the other hand, you think the person on the other side is lying through his teeth, uh, you might welcome the technology then. So, you know, and things like this work at two levels. There's sort of the broad level, you ask people, what do you think about lie detection? And they have a response. And then you, then they get into a dispute, and you say, would you like to use it in your particular dispute? And it's likely to be a very, it may well be a very different response. So I think that if it ever became widespread, it would be because become widespread because people in specific disputes they were in thought it was going to be to their advantage to have this used, or imagine themselves in disputes where they thought it would be to their advantage to have this be used. Um, working at sort of a different, whatever they think universally about light detection or not, once they get into a specific circumstance, then I think they're likely to have a, the situation is likely to uh, lead to their reaction, and whatever their overall principles are. Not universally, but Situations make a difference in how people think about things. I think generally, socially, people feel, I think Hank's right, people feel very conflicted about this. You can tell. There's a very famous story during Prohibition where they went to a uh, politician who was running for office and asked him what he thought about alcohol. And he said, if you're asking me about that medicinal elixir, um, the elixir of the gods, the uh, use of a ritual of wine, I think it's a wonderful thing. If you're asking me about the devil's brew, that, you know, and then he said, I'm against it, right? So it's the same thing with lie detection. If you, if you present lie detection forensically the way Steve does, and say, look, you know, we have people who are falsely accused, we have all kinds of problems in, in, in the courtroom that uh, come from people uh, 
Calvinizes the book, and this could be a useful tool to prevent injustice, I think people would answer one way. If you talk about the fact that you know, people in our country are very, very um, suspicious of the government. And if you say to them, we now have a tool that will be in the hands of the government and the courts, by which they're going to be able to tell at any time when you come into them whether they're telling the truth or lying, people will say they don't want it. So I think a lot of it's going to be how it's framed. And then and, and another piece, I mean, Hank mentioned <clears throat> that there have been a number of articles that have been written asking questions about writing between them and the Fifth Amendment. Yeah, we wrote the first one, actually. As a law student and I wrote the first article suggesting it wasn't about lie detection. It was saying, if we ever get to the point where we can actually extract a useful piece of information from someone's brain that can be used to determine their guilt or innocence, it doesn't have to be lie detection. I mean, we were actually thinking of something even more robust. Then the question becomes, um, is that testimony or not testimony? If we could actually pull out of someone's brain, you know, I did it, I killed her, right? Is that a testimonial piece of evidence or not? It's a very complex question. But one of the things I've always thought about that was, oh, by the way, I should say, once it gets to, it, it is intrinsically neither testimonial nor non testimonial. That is, there's something qualitatively new about this ability to, to actually <coughs> apprehend information directly from the brain. Before, you know, a decade and a half ago, no human being could do that in the history of the planet. It is a brand new thing. All the information we ever got from a human being throughout all of human history, virtually without exception, we got from the peripheral nervous system. And now for the first time in history, we can get information directly from the central nervous system. And that, to me, changed it. It is rare that you get something that profoundly, qualitatively new and different. And I think it sets up a new kind of question. What is the nature of that information? that we can, for the first time in human history, get directly from the brain. And I, don't, I think the question of whether certain kinds of information are testimonial or non-testimonial when you take them directly from the brain is a question that has no actual meaning because we have determined testimony versus non-testimony entirely on peripheral nervous system ways of communicating, expression, heartbeat, gesture, language, whatever it might be. So now we have this new thing, and I don't think it can intrinsically be defined as testimonial or non-testimonial. The court's going to make that decision, but that decision is going to be made on a host of other kinds of criteria. And what I deeply believe is that if that ever does get up to the Supreme Court, and I think it will, they're going to make the decision based on the fact that I predict that the public will absolutely not want it to be considered, to be allowed. They will not want the court to be able to go into the brains of, of the people of the United States and take out information involuntarily. Involuntarily, right. Involuntary. That's a very important key. I said that in turn out involuntarily. If you want to go to speed, I think that's great. But involuntarily. And so I think there's a I think that the the feedback from the public on these issues is going to have a profound impact on how the courts ultimately determine these issues. Just to add to that for a second, I think this will be a question that the Supreme Court will ultimately have to answer. And the precedents are such that these legal terms, testimonial and non testimonial, could be filled in either way. My guess is with Paul that the Supreme Court will hope that it is testimonial for these purposes and, and does implicate the privilege against self incrimination. Personally, though, I'm looking forward to reading the opinions of those justices who focused very much on 1789. Uh, so the recent GPS, you need a search warrant to put a GPS on a car, followed around a big Supreme Court case from a couple of months ago. And Justice Scalia was saying, well, it's not that different than if in 1789 you were in a stagecoach and a magistrate was hiding in the back of the stagecoach. So it's really kind of the same thing. Uh, I'll be interested in reading his opinion about uh, FMRI light <laughs> Thank you. 
claim that was testimony. Right. So, uh, Daniel's suggestion of uh, show people a picture and see what their brains do, I think, is the harder piece for this. I think you've got a setup where you're asking somebody a question and forcing them to answer and then seeing whether it's truth or lie based on brain. I don't think the court will have any trouble saying that's testimonial because the guy is actually saying something. If you're looking at sort of an invoked involuntary silent speech, that'll be harder. And if you're looking at sort of an invoked reaction from seeing a photo, that'll be harder. And I think that's the kind of case that actually will be the harder one that we'll get to the Supreme Court. On this issue, I want to plug what I think is a genuinely great new law review article by Nina Karahani published in the Stanford Law Review called Incriminating Thoughts, where she very nicely sets out four different kinds of um, conceivable neuroscience-based evidence and analyzes them as, as implicating different things we care about with the Fifth Amendment. Incriminating Thoughts, Stanford Law Review, Nina Farahani, F-A-R-A-H-A, and Y. Incentives. And what we saw is that money didn't change the incentives, 
But what we did see is that the second scan made a difference over the first scan. If people got tired, we did two back-to-back -back scans. And if the second scan was done second, that we started losing signal. And I think that's because they've been in the scan now for half an hour, getting tired. So, you know, again, I, I think that if people want to beat the test, there was a way to beat it. People asked me all the time how to beat it. Sleep, be tired, be really tired. But that's the only, you know, but the more you engage, the more that it matters to you, the more that you're really trying to do this stuff, the, the more that you bring to the show. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you recall the, the, the slide that I made of sort of the process of retrieval of information that ends in a very brief episode when uh, deception, per se, takes place. So I think it's important to uh, remember or think about it uh, as also time, uh, process of time. And I think the reason uh, all these issues are important, but they probably do not change that activity during that one single episode, is because we're looking just at that and try not to see anything else uh, for the purpose of, for forensic purposes. If you, on the other hand, for research purposes, you are very interested in the entire, entire thing. But it's very, in my opinion, it's very possible that little event where you have suppressed retrieved memory and replaced it with another, at that, at that moment probably is invariant and does not change across uh, all those different settings. And you want it to be, if it included endorsement, etc. Except the endorsement that occurs, command, I think endorsement occurs at every trial. That, that would be my prediction as far as the importance of these things. I don't think it will make a difference for that very moment. However, if we're looking for intentions, that would be an entirely different study. And uh, there are uh, very interesting studies from Berlin, uh, John, uh, John Bell and uh, Dylan Haynes, uh, who actually have done an ancient neuroscience paper about uh, the difference between anticipation of action and then the action itself. And they are quite different. I have a question about maybe for Caroline and then Steve as well, the others, about the, the the technology essentially, not irrespective of live detection or not, but the the where we are with the the fMRI technique per se and its amplification, uh, what it really means essentially about what we see. Because I think the not the, the thing about fMRI obviously not uh, in, in the scientific literature, but also I can imagine in protocol, is that these are beautiful images that are very impressive. And, and we know really how, how it works, obviously, at least the very well, the way that these blobs come on the surface of the brain. But for a jury, jury it can be very impressive. Uh, and you show that really with this, you can see, OK, so it's black and white. So anybody can be very impressed by that. But obviously, there's a lot of, of of interpretation of these data, the analysis of data, but also just the significance of what really, like the bold signal. I think where is the status of that? What it really means? And also, maybe for Caroline, who's very in that field, at you know, the scientific level, where, what are the future developments that are really on the pipeline somehow? That do you see the fMRI becoming? Go to a level where technologically it could be essentially even really more acceptable as a tool for this kind of uh, like light detection, also use it essentially people for a lot. Oh, great question. So it, I think um, one of the issues with the whole sig signal of MRR is that it's a very small signal between baseline and the activated state. The, the difference in blood oxygenation that you're looking at is just a few percent difference. So where you get a robust signal is where you have um, real, um, very bold activations. Oh, excuse the pun, but very robust activations. So, so some of the studies that Nan showed had 40 subjects, 60 subjects, multiple repetitions, and multiple subjects that are um, you know, within a narrow age range, all right-handed, uh, you know, selected to be somewhat uniform, and then compared with uh, control populations, and that's how you, uh, you know, derive those areas that are characterized by the task you're looking at. Um, taking that to 
single subject is the real challenge, and you addressed that uh, quite nice, nicely. That is a real challenge. Um, so where is fMRI used robustly on a clinical basis in pretty limited circumstances? So um, for, uh, say, uh, pre-surgical mapping of a brain tumor to look at where the motor cortex is, where you may be tapping your finger, something that's a, a very, um, that really causes a major signal change, um, or uh, speech, or rock auto test. But cognitive tests and tasks on a single subject basis are exceedingly challenging. And assigning a sensitivity specificity to that is, is inherently, I think, very challenging with the fMRI signal. So um, we've come a long way over the past few years with uh, the kinds of analyses and the higher fields and coils um, and 32 channels and all of that. Um, but still inherently, it's very difficult. Um, then there are some of the variables that have been mentioned, but um, also the age of the subject, the normal variation brain, people being left-handed, right-handed, um, uh, some of the uh, issues in terms of the types of situations. So we're not looking at matching to a single subject and having that same uh, routine task, but having someone talk about a specific situation to them, which is a variable situation across subjects. So you have the issues of attention and uh, situation. So, I think it, it's very challenging. Um, yeah, um, you know, in, in the summer case, there was no challenge brought up in the I actually, you know, I, I thought that there would be a lot of issues with like that when the experts in the prosecution. From a scientific point, when you're looking at 20,000 papers that have been published on MRI, it's hard to imagine that the scientific community has a debate that both the signal or is it a useful technology? And there was basically no discussion or debate about that. So if anybody you go to court, you probably get that from an item. What you use it for is your next challenge. Um, you know, we made a decision sitting on a lot of these panels, and included, you know, about whether or not we should submit paper, whether or not we should submit, you know, pictures and that. I mean, there's a hypothesis here. I haven't seen any data on it, but there's a hypothesis that that's going to widely sway juries into Oh my God! There's a picture that looks true, and in fact, you know, there's actually judicial precedent for introducing pictures at trials because people were like, "You can't introduce a picture at trial." Oh my God! If you introduce a picture at trial, you can sway a jury, and you know, there's there's long history of that. So I mean, we made again sitting on these panels, we made the decision. I don't look at these pictures. I don't review these pictures. I don't examine those pictures. If I look at those pictures and I put them in a report, it's only because you know a client wants to see what their brain looked like, you know, not because it has any sort of salience to me. Um, and so, you know, when we submit this stuff in a court, I don't plan, and I haven't submitted any pictures, because again, it's not, it's, it's a false representation of what we do scientifically. Now, I think it's in the journal. Although the your point is in law and psychology, or maybe just law and psychology. So, and I'm a little, uh, you know, friends of mine are the authors of this, but I'm a little, Leery about it because it's an internet only uh, survey. So they've got an internet based sample that's been looking at things over the internet and they didn't find that reaction. And they didn't believe it, so they kept working at it and working at it, and they didn't find any bias created by the use of images versus non, non images. They're still not sure they believe their results because everybody intuitively thinks that's got to be wrong. But the results are what they are, and uh, I'd be happy to uh, email me or each group at standard.edu and I'll find the, the reference to it. The other thing I, I want to note that we haven't talked about, this has been a, a symposium on fMRI-based light detection, and that has been what's gotten a disproportionate amount of attention for a variety of reasons. But there are other methods out there, Daniel mentioned a couple of them. Uh, I think the EEG method using the concealed information test is a real contender for providing um, some form of lie detection-like evidence 
this guy, uh, Peter Rosenfeld of Northwestern, who Daniel mentioned, has been working on this for a long, long time. And he, uh, I'm a co-author with him on a review article about some of it. And I went into that co-authorship pretty skeptical. And after reading all the stuff that he cited, I think that may actually turn out to work, um, although I still want to see some ecologically realistic uses. And I would note that EPG has a lot of advantages over MRI. It's a lot cheaper, easier, more portable. You can take that to prisons and jails in the way you can. You, know, you don't have to bring the prisoner, which is often difficult, to the machine. So when we think about neuroscience and light detection, just remember it's not all fMRI. It may be that one of the uh, different modalities that's being investigated, or maybe not. It is an interesting piece of social history. I think part of why the EEG stuff has been disregarded is it had an early advocate who was who vastly overclaimed, who also claims to be able to levitate as a result of transcendental meditation, which has nothing to do with the validity of his science per se, but gives people some pause. <laughs> and this is Farwell. Farwell. Uh, who's got basically one peer-reviewed publication in 1991 and nothing since. And he made such vast overclaims for his technology that the whole field got a bad name. And so part of what happens in science and in life is these quirky, you know, life happens and quirky things affect the direction of history. And Larry Farwell is definitely a quirky thing. <laughs> About the, uh, the question about the pictures, I, I, I sort of think, I think of this as a bit of a red herring because it seems to me that it would be um, very easy to just exclude the, the pictures of the, of the brain scan, as, as Dr. Wilson said. Um, so I think it's, it's sort of a distraction, and um, also there's, there's a long history as with uh, suspicion of photographs when photographs were first uh, offered as evidence. Um, and other kinds of expertise where uh, there's a there's a well-known case in California called the Collins case where statistical evidence is offered, and it was bad statistics, so that's another question, but um, but the court says something like uh, mathematics is a veritable sorcerer and it's you know, it's, uh, it's a danger that it's gonna overwhelm the jury and the jury will be able to decide. And there's a lot of research on this, there's a lot of academic scholarship about whether jurors are overwhelmed by things like um, you know, of the expert, the, the white coat, um, et cetera. And it's very conflicted. It's not at all clear that jurors are overwhelmed by, by this sort of evidence. Um, I thought that was great. So my question is from a slightly different field. Um, it's a forward question about empathy and morality. Um, so many of the regions that you guys cited uh, overlap with regions seen in fMRI studies of empathy and of morality. So I was wondering um, if there might be any chance that the responses in um, the lie detection test are in any way moderated by the activity seen during an empathy or morality test. Um, and if they were, would that in any way um, affect the credibility of the lie detection test? So uh, I 
I think this will be the cause of the twin subject variability in the use of trying to study deception. Uh, as far as uh, empathy, same same thing. I think this would be subject characteristics. Uh, if they're performing some kind of lie test or task. Uh, and I, I wanted to, um, uh, to um, when you when you try to test deception, you actually are making people can do a task that generates deception. Okay? By this you put in their behavior in a very strict format. And this is how it's done in the real world as well. So this is not producing ecological validity. So you're creating the, the paradigm. It, it, this is not free behavior. But as, as far as, did I answer your question? As far as what will happen, depending on the morality or empathy. Uh, so maybe you can then try and uh, specifically narrow down a little bit more. <laughs> well, you yeah, asked. Maybe because I don't feel satisfied with the answer. You may have actually answered my question, but I might. Well, you're asking how does empathy, morality, and deception interact? Um, no, I'm more asking for the actual, like, the functional component. So, like, if you give somebody the lie detection test and you give somebody a test on empathy, does their response on the empathy test actually moderate their responses on the other tests? So, depending on your level of morality, will you respond differently in a lie detection test? Yes, and I think that's exactly that was my answer. I believe so, and I think it's an inherent source of variability between, you know, maybe number 19 on my little list there was particularly moral or vice versa. <laughs> uh, but if you want to actually study three things, put three of those things together, I think it would be a little difficult. Two together, Paxton and Green have done that, and they've been finding patterns very similar to a line one through the differences. Great question, and uh, so maybe this is something you want to undertake in the study. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it goes all the way back to Emmanuel Kant, who saw just any kind of lies, and he came to the message that your life was bad. So we should try him. Or somebody like him. And I think now you just made it even worse because you now have four states of beliefs. It's a. Uh, can I just add, I add one more thing that uh, if nothing came up here? We treat we treat fMRI here as all fMRI is the fMRI. MRI is a whole world, it's basically a world. And all the fMRI is probably not even most of the application of practical um, magnetic resonance imaging. So there are so many other very promising functional fMRI applications, and within all there are myriad of protocols. And none of that stuff was tested as far as what would be most suitable for this particular question. Um, I, I have a question. Um, I, I was surprised that uh, kind of Dr. Lockman in your uh, talk that you were indicating that was, you had greater than 90% accuracy in terms of the technical lines. And this was, has been talked about a little bit uh, already. Uh, you know, in bold signal, there's only a couple of percent uh, increase in blood flow. Uh, my understanding of uh, fMRI literature is that there's a huge amount of variability from subject to subject and from trial to trial, and that uh, typically um, uh, blood flow studies are a population studies. So, if so, I guess what I what I'm getting at is I kind of like to put uh, you guys' feet to the fire. Um, how many of you? really think that at a single person level, uh, functional imaging can be used to uh, detect lies at greater than 90% greater than accuracy? Um, it's, it's a great question and one that I think is missed on a lot of people. Since 2004, we've been doing single person functional MRI. Well before people thought we could use single person functional MRI. Now, one of the, maybe it's just dumb 
level up and coming into the field and having no clue that you couldn't do functional MRI for this, and I just came, you know, came at it from a different point. There were seven regions that were activated. We looked at all seven of those regions. Four of those regions weren't any better than 50-50 at predicting in an individual whether or not that person was being deceptive. Now, these, it's an interesting thing because those are reported in papers. All functional MRI scientists will report all the brain regions that are activated. But there are very few, if any, reports where people actually go back and say, okay, here's the region of interest, let's pull out all those voxels, let's take all the 100 voxels, and let's see how well they predict in my task in those 100 individuals. It's a statistics. So if you have 100 individuals, you could have 20 individuals that are off the chart, and the other you know, 80 individuals are just 50, 50 back and forth. What does that mean for your you know, power of being able to discriminate? It's not very good. We were doing some pain research, and we actually went, you know, same thing. We did the same thing. We took the, the group maps, we went back to the group maps, we went from the group maps back to the same individuals that they were developed on. And from those group maps, from the voxels that were activated, there wasn't very good prediction in a lot of those activations in the group of, of you know, people that we were looking at. Basically, 50 50. It really makes a question on what, what is the validity, what does it mean when we're looking at these statistical activations? It means, again, in a group, we're seeing in this group. But what's not reported, and what probably should be reported in functional MRI is from that group, go back and look at that voxel and see how many are activated from that voxel. Now, of the three regions that we looked at, we excluded four. Of the three regions that we looked at, it's, I think it's a little bit like hand grenades. You know, we're close. Does it mean that everybody activates cluster one, cluster two, and cluster four? No, not at all. You see huge variabilities that some people have cluster one sky high, you know, 500 on the live, cluster two, cluster four will be negative numbers. There's more activation on the two. Overall, we'll see one, two, and four. There's more activation on one, two, and four when you add them together and you put them together as a group, as a cluster. Does that, does that make sense? So we see a huge amount of variability. Don't get me wrong. We see a huge variability. But for whatever reason, and again, you know, our science is luck. It seems to work. And when we do these studies time and time again on hundreds of subjects, on different types of lies, you know, different ethnicities, different handedness, different age groups, it seems to predict. And, and I, I would correct one thing. You know, I, I try to say that our accuracy rates in our published literature, when I'm up on, you know, when I testify, is somewhere between 75 and 97 percent. That's what it is. I, you know, I can't, that's what our studies show. And you know, it's, it's really, I, I think it's a disservice to say that it's 97 percent. That's what it is. But, you know, because that's not an accurate reflection of the science. I think the, the question is, do we truly know what the gold standard is? I mean, in a single subject, comparing um, your results to, to truth, what's the truth? So, I think the question is. If, how is there a true sensitivity, specificity, or accuracy in the single subject? Is there no one situation uh, in this individual? So I, I, um, I think we're, we're not quite there yet. I think it's a little shy. But I, I'm interested that Steve's actually practicing it. What is true? Yeah, I, I mean, okay, so when you come around to testing, you tell someone they're lying. And they say, you're right, I was lying. You know, it's an end of one. I mean, we've had two cases of people that have flown in, you know, and we say you're lying, and they say, yep, that was. What does that tell you? You know, from a scientific point of view, it doesn't tell you anything. Is this an end of two? Does it make me feel more confident or less confident that my science works? I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't feel before this that my science worked. And I'm not going to take an end of one or an end of two to be like, yeah, my science really works now because some people <laughs> didn't have this test done and I caught them lying. I mean, that's not a good way of doing science. You do science by doing your lab work, doing your blind analysis, testing your protocols and procedures, and then and then going out to the population that you intend to offer it to. And you know, we get we can't get caught up in end of ones or end of twos. You know, I mean, Summer of the case, we said that he was was telling the truth. What did the jury find? He was telling the truth, you know? Obviously, they, I don't know if they felt, felt he was telling the truth, but the jury came to a not guilty verdict on the things that we tested him on. On the things that we tested him on. 
the two counts that they found him guilty on weren't the things we tested them for. Does that make you feel more confident that what we're doing is accurate? You know, it, it, I don't know. It doesn't, have, you know, it's an NFL. The common, common uh, state versus street burger. He's telling the truth. That's what our de determination is. Is there a lot of other bad science that went into that case? Yeah. Can I say convincingly that I, you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know for sure that three burger is telling the truth? I, I can't say that. Why? These are our accuracy rates. Do we make mistakes? Sure. Can that be a mistake? Sure. Do I have any indication that that's a mistake? No. Could it be a mistake? Sure. I mean, that's the, that's the best that we can do. You know, when you go into medicine and you have a test done and your doctor says, you know, this is positive, does it mean you have cancer? No. This is your rate. These are your rates and this is your chance of having in, in medicine, when we sign an accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, there usually is a ground truth to compare to whether it's a, a biopsy or surgical to show the patient outcome. And, and here in the real world setting, the problem is there isn't a, a ground truth. And if the, the jury will refer to just the ground truth, that, that's probably what's up. So I, I think it's a challenge here to, to accuracy. I just wanted to say that on that, the paper about images, uh, it's Nick Schweitzer, uh, Psychology, Public Policy and Law, 2011. Maybe you're interested in it. And I swear it's the only paper I've ever seen where the authors still aren't sure they believe their results. <laughs> <laughs> and will it say that publicly? Yeah, they're making a lot of people say it publicly.